The remote hearing of the Capital Investment Committee for March 31st called to order. This remote hearing is taking place in accordance to House 10, Rule 10.01 and is being live streamed by the House Public Information Office. Mr. Wilcox, please take the roll. Chair Lee. Lee present. Lee present. Vice Chair Murphy, excused. Representative Erdahl. Present. Erdahl present. Representative McBadget. Present. McBadget present. Representative Berg. Present. Berg present. Representative Davids. Davids present. Davids present. Representative Frankie. Frankie present. Frankie present. Representative Freiberg. Present. Freiberg present. Representative Hansen. Present. Hansen present. Representative Hewitt. Uh -huh. Hewitt present. Representative Lilly. Lilly present. Lily present. Representative Lucero. Mr. Wilcox, 11 the shirt and tie this morning. Thank you. Lucero present. Representative Moran. Present. Moran present. Representative Pearson. Pearson present. Pearson present. Representative Raleigh. Raleigh present. Raleigh present. Representative Rasmussen. Rasmussen present. Rasmussen present. Representative Ryer. Ryer present. Ryer present. Representative West. Representative West. Present. West present. And Representative Jean. Here. Jean present. Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. A quorum is present. Chair Lilly, may I have a motion to approve the minutes for Tuesday, March 29th? Yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to move the minutes for the March 29th meeting. Uh, Chair Lilly moves to approve the minutes for Tuesday, March 29th. Members, any discussions? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the minutes for Tuesday, March 29th are approved. Uh, members, today we will continue to hear bill presentation on an informational basis only with amendments offered for reference. So th today we have 14 bills and each bill is, is all allotted five minutes. And first up is uh, Representative Lilly presenting on behalf of Representative Pinto, House File 4625. Please proceed, Representative Lilly. Good morning, Mr. Chair and uh, members. Uh, thank you for hearing uh, this bill today for Representative Pinto. It's uh, for the uh, neighborhood house. And uh, um, I have with me today someone to get into a greater detail, but uh, I'm, I don't know if you've all heard about this program. Uh, they do some great work and have a long history and of doing good work in the St. Paul area. So if I could uh, uh, have my presenter, Help me out. Uh, that'd be great, sir. Thank you, Mr. Ms. Chair. Ms. Brady, thank you, uh, Representative Lilly. Ms. Brady, please identify yourself. And thank you. Thank you, Representative Lilly and Chair Lee and members of the committee. I am Nancy Brady. I'm the president and CEO of Neighborhood House. We are a 125-year-old social services agency serving uh, about 15,000 people a year annually in St. Paul. We've been serving, serving families in the far western area of the West 7th Street for nearly three decades. About a third of the households in that area make less than $35,000 a year and are housing burdened and struggle to meet other basic needs. Many work at the airport and the Mall of America. Many are seniors trying to age in place. We are currently working in a variety of spaces throughout the area, most with limited accessibility, limited power, limited space, and lacking dignity. We plan to build an $8 million integrated service center that will offer food support, family coaching, housing services, preschool, and adult education for families of that way West 7th area and we are seeking $750,000 from the legislature to get us started. We intend to raise the remaining funds from private sources. Any questions for us? Uh, Ms. Brady, I have a Shad Klukas here. Uh, yes. Is Shad going to present too, or is it here? No, he's there to answer questions should anything arise that okay. I don't have the detail. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker and uh, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> well, maybe sometime. Uh, yep. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to the uh, testifier, I I'm sorry, my uh, audio was garbled. Uh, 
How much money were you seeking? $750,000 is what we're seeking from the legislature. Representative Erdogan. Um, yes, yeah, so, and that would be cash, I assume. Thank you, Mr. Being here. Yeah. Uh, Charlie Lee is nodding his head, yes. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. Representative Erdogan. Thank you. All right, thank you, Representative Lilly, for coming by to present on behalf of Representative Pinto. Next on the agenda is House Bill 3546. Uh, Representative Hassan. Good morning, Mr. Chair and members. <clears throat> Sorry, I was running late. I had two other meetings. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present House File 3546, which is 5 million cash ask for the expansion and renovation of Norway House. Norway House is located on the Franklin, uh, Franklin Cultural Corridor and shares a block with the American uh, Indian Center and many other indigenous cultural uh, centers. Um, I believe I have uh, the executive director of Norway House to explain uh, more in detail of the project and we will stand for questions. So I have on my sheet, Rebecca Sunquist, please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning, Rebecca Sunquist, and I'm representing uh, Executive Director Christina Carlton this morning. And I'd like to do a screen share. Okay, this is a picture of the new Norway House. Norway House was founded in 2004. Uh, the mission of Norway House is to connect the United States and contemporary Norway through arts, business, and culture. There are over a million Minnesotans who have Norwegian heritage. So is it any wonder that uh, we need a cultural center? Uh, as Representative Hazan said, we are located uh, at the corner of Chicago Avenue and Franklin Avenue. You might wonder why did we locate there? Uh, it was the landing place for Norwegian immigrants over a hundred years ago. Uh, and just as the neighborhood welcomes new immigrants today, Norway House reaches out in welcome to be an anchor in a very challenging neighborhood. We have put our stake in the ground and we intend to be a force for good. Uh, Minda Kirken Lutheran Church shares the city block with us. Minda Kirken is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. And it's the only church in America that still worships every Sunday in Norwegian. Uh, Norway House has become a vibrant community meeting spot uh, we opened the Albert H. Kui Education Center in 2015, and word has spread. The new building, uh, as you see pictured here, is designed to mimic a ship in a safe harbor. And that is a metaphor for the role that Norway House plays in the community, a safe harbor. Our events and programs celebrate arts and culture, including the cultures represented in our neighborhood and our exhibits in the gallery bring the world to our doorstep. Key programs at Norway House include the Minnesota Peace Initiative, the Edward Grieg Society, Barn, which is a business accelerator program, Barnahauga, a preschool program, and many, many other groups and gatherings. Uh, Norway House has several tenants. It's been a very popular space for renting office space in the neighborhood. It's reasonably priced and has good parking and it's safe. Uh, one of our tenants is Global Translation and Interpreter. Their primary business is interpreting medical records and documents for immigrants, a very important role in the community. Uh, Norway House is requesting $5 million cash from the state of Minnesota to assist in finishing our $20 million campaign. Uh, support to date has come from the state of Minnesota, the Norwegian government, uh, family foundations, and over a thousand individual donors. The 18,000 square foot addition is scheduled to be completed at the end of 22. Uh, and you might be wondering, why do we need additional funding? Uh, the architect on this project, while very talented, totally missed the mark on pricing. Uh, we, like everyone else, had COVID delays and there have been staggering increases in the cost of materials. So Norway House uh, respectfully requests $5 million cash from the state of Minnesota. Uh, in order for us to be an anchor and a force for good in the community, we need place. You can only carry out the mission of your organization with place. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sunquist. Uh, Representative Hassan, it seems like you have a supporter in Representative Erdahl. Representative Erdahl, you wanna say anything? 
100% Lily is also wearing the uh, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh, the flag comes out. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, just briefly, uh, I've been to uh, many events at Norway House. I think it provides a, a valuable service uh, to uh, reminding people of their culture, uh, Norwegian culture, and uh, does a, uh, very, a very good service. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to do something. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. And thank you, Representative Hassan, for coming by to present your bill. Next on the agenda is House File 3698. Chair Schultz, please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members. House File 3698 is a bill that will provide funds to First Witness Child Advocacy Center. It's for the purchase and renovation of a larger building for their center. First Witness Child Advocacy Center is a child-focused nonprofit agency offering hope, healing, and justice for alleged victims of child abuse and their families. I'm bringing forth this bill because since its inception nearly 30 years ago, they have grown in number of the children they serve and the services they provide. It leads them towards a vision we can all get behind. They provide excellent services and they're so desperately needed in the state. They want to support children and they want to end child abuse. 10 years ago, they served 70 children. Last year, they served 230 children, providing child-friendly, legally defensible forensic interviews, intensive ongoing advocacy, mental health services, and medical exams. They facilitate a multidisciplinary team approach, working with local law enforcement, child protection, and attorneys to accomplish the best outcomes for children. And I believe I have one testifier today. Thank you, Chair Schultz. Uh, Ms. Klana, please identify yourself and proceed. Hello, Chair Lee and members of the committee. My name is Tracy Klana, and I am the Executive Director of First Witness Child Advocacy Center. As Chair Schultz mentioned, this is a bill about cash funds for the purchase and renovation of a larger building for our growing center that serves Northeastern Minnesota. According to the CDC, one in seven girls one in 13 boys and one in four non-binary youth in the US will be sexually abused before the age of 18. 30 years ago, our center was built to serve as a place for child-friendly forensic interviews performed by a multidisciplinary team of law enforcement, social services, and prosecuting attorneys. As you can see in our summary, our impact continues to climb both in numbers and in services. First Witness sees our role in disrupting the cycle of violence and building safety both on the individual and on the community level. Our team of professionally trained, foren professionally trained forensic interviews, interviewers protect child victims with safe evidence-based techniques. Our family advocates build connections across systems and represent families' needs. Our prevention educators spend time in classrooms, empowering children around safety strategies and freedom from self-blame. They train teachers and parents both on prevention and response. The rise in need for our services has led us to desperately need a new and much larger building a building that works for families we serve and as a national training center. This new building would include child and teen centered spaces, a space for ongoing advocacy services, a medical exam room, a mental health office, an additional forensic interview room, a multidisciplinary team space that allows for law enforcement and social services to truly respond to the needs of, of these cases. The course of child abuse investigation is challenging to navigate. To address this, we offer a comprehensive and holistic child advocacy center that provides effective prevention, intervention, and systems change. Thank you for your consideration of this bill, and I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Ms. Klana. Uh, seeing no questions, thank you, uh, Chair Schultz, for coming by. Uh, the next three bill on the agenda is Representative Schumacher. The first one is House File 4417. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members. Uh, the bill in front of you now is 
for uh, Child Care Center for the region of Laverne. And with us today, we have uh, Pat Boston, the mayor of Laverne, and Holly Sammons, the economic developer for Laverne, to discuss the project. Mayor Boston, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Representative Chair Lee. I'm Mayor Pat Boston uh, for the city of Laverne, and with me is our Economic Development Authority Director, Holly Sammons. I will turn it over to uh, uh, Holly Sammons for a uh, review of our request. Ms. Sammons, please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning. I'm Holly Sammons, Economic Development Director for the city of Laverne. We are here to request funds for a Laverne Child Care Center. Child care is an essential part of economic development and is a critical part of the social infrastructure of a healthy community. The lack of avail availability of child care is having a negative impact on our region. Employers are having difficulty attracting and retaining staff due to the lack of daycare options. To further prove this point, the in-home daycare providers in Rock County are rapidly declining. In 2016, there was 56 licensed providers, which offered 662 child care slots. That number dropped to 37 providers in 2019 and further to 28 providers in 2022. So we have gone from 56 providers to 28 providers with only 336 uh, licensed slots available. Because of this, young families are choosing to live in places like Brandon, South Dakota and Sioux Falls, South Dakota, just 20 miles away where they can find more childcare options easily and readily available. I'm going to share my screen. Our local leaders are committed to facilitating the creation of a local child care center that will serve the needs of Laverne and Rock County. It has been proven that the private sector alone is unable to acquire or build a child care center based on costs, local rates, and wages. The city of Laverne acquired a 30,000 square foot facility, which is well suited to be repurposed as a child care center. This would facilitate the creation of a center for 186 seats. Local resources alone cannot support the significant investment needed for this one-time capital investment for renovation. Therefore, we are requesting $3,447,946 in state funds for acquisition, renovation, furnishing, and equipping a child care facility in which to provide child care services for Laverne and Rock County. The city of Laverne is committed to supporting the ongoing operations once the center is established to ensure the sustainability and the success of the center. The city will own the building and they will sign a management contract with the nonprofit entity and lease the building for $1 per year to this nonprofit. The nonprofit would be the entity that would then acquire the child care license and carry out the daily operations to offer the child care services. The city and the nonprofit will partner with all of the local and regional area businesses and organizations to help support the center to address this critical need for child care within our community. Certainly, we're open for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Ms. Sammons. I uh, see no question. Next on the agenda is Representative Schumacher, House File 4353. Please proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee. This is for the Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water Projects, and uh, a couple of requests that they have in there. With me today is Jason Overby, the General Manager of Lincoln Pipestone Rural Water for you. Mr. Overby, uh, Mr. Overby, I apologize. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. I am Jason Overby, General Manager of Lincoln Pipe Solar Rural Water System. I have come to request your continued consideration and support for House File 4353, LPRW's water system infrastructure improvements project and our request for $12.85 million for this project. Since its formation in the 1970s, LPRW has expanded to serve 36 communities, as well as over 4,600 rural customers across 10 counties of southwestern Minnesota. LPRW continues to secure and manage reliable water sources, maintain and improve upon existing infrastructure in meeting its mission of providing reliable, high quality, affordable water in an environmentally responsible manner through a publicly owned system. LPRW faces a number of issues that need addressing to continue to provide drinking water to its existing and potential future customers. As a public body formed under state statute, LPRW unfortunately has not been eligible for direct ARPA funding for water improvements and thus is pursuing other funding mechanisms. Our pack packages as follows. First, we are seeking 
biological filtration and treatment upgrades to provide high quality, reliable drinking water from shallow groundwater sources that harbor elevated nitrates, as well as reestablishing source water capacity from currently unused production wells. The loss of the previous reverse osmosis treatment system has result, resulted in reduction of one half of our pollen water source treatment capacity and shutdown of several production wells. We plan to use an innovative approach which uses naturally occurring denitrifying bacteria in the aquifer to convert nitrates to nitrogen gas, ultimately releasing it to the atmosphere. LPRW has conducted this pilot study in 2013 using this technology with absolute success, taking 20 parts per million nitrate water to less than one part. Next, there is a need for water treatment improvements at our existing BRRRR facility. We are projecting an extra 500,000 gallons of storage on site, as well as a new contact basin in order to facilitate routine maintenance and maintain long-term reliability. The BRRRR water source is crucial to the LPRW system and aging infrastructure here, puts the facility's reliability into question, potentially impacting a third of our system. The project will fund the addition of new transmission and delivery infrastructure, allowing for long-term reliability to our rural residents and communities. As the rural water system expands uh, and more communities express their desire to connect, we are quickly reaching the limits of our transmission capacity. Building a new elevated storage tank and transmission lines will allow us to transmit water from two water supply sources across the system during times of drought, as seen last year, and during high demand periods. Finally, this project will help fund the construction of a new centralized location of our organization. We are currently working out of, a, out of a retrofitted house. Some of the staff are relegated to do administrative work out of the service trucks, and our building is not fully ADA compliant. We desire to upgrade the current working conditions and improve our operational efficiency by utilizing 15 acres that has been gifted to us by the city of Lake Benton in order to keep Lake of Pison rural water, one of the largest employers in this town, local. Additionally, our primary maintenance and material storage facility is 11 miles distance from our main office. This new building and storage yard will allow us to operate more efficiently in a centralized location and be a prominent fixture within this community. So this funding will allow LPRW to continue to provide reliable, safe drinking water that is affordable for rural residents, businesses, and communities. It will make options available for communities suffering from poor water quality, limited quantities, or waste stream compliance. And finally, it will allow for continued growth and viability in rural southwestern Minnesota. It's all about the water for the future. We are seeking every source of funding available to us, including a pursuit of a USDA rural development loan to supplement direct appropriations of these improvements. If you have any questions or would like to more, learn more specific information about this package, that's not on the handout provided, I'll uh, be happy to answer that to the committee. Mr. Chair, thank you for your time and consideration today. Thank you, uh, Mr. Overby. Seeing no questions from members, we'll move on to the next bill. House File 4280, Representative Schumacher. Thank you, Chair Lee and members of the committee. This is for a Rock County Rural Water request for a water tower. With us today, we have Ryan Holtz, Rock County Rural Water Manager, Wayne Thompson, the Rock County Rural Water Vice President, and Scott Lewis Rock, the Rock County Rural Water Board Director. Uh, Mr. Holtz, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, Ryan Holtz, Manager of Rock County Rural Water. Uh, first off, thank you, thank you everybody for your time this morning. Um, Rock County Rural Water is a smaller water system that uh, takes care of uh, the vast majority of, of Rock County. Uh, we take care or serve five small towns and uh, as well as all the rural customers. Uh, in the last two uh, yearly surveys that we have with the Minnesota Department of Health, they have uh, highly recommended that we uh, add more one day storage to our system. Uh, we are significantly low on that. Um, the, the tower itself, we would be able to blend uh, the high quality Lewis and Clark water with the water that we currently pump out of our treatment plant. Uh, it would provide fire protection to all rural water customers as well as the cities we serve. Um, in the event of a power outage, natural disaster or a system disruption, it would provide adequate pressure to all customers. Uh, it would also help with economic growth in the towns that we serve. They would have more uh, uh, a 
susceptibility to high quality water. Um, the, the, uh, the, if the tower was to be funded by Rock County Rural Water itself, it would put an unreasonable burden on our customers just because of the cost of the tower. So, uh, uh, and, and the reason that is, is the vast majority of our budget uh, goes to operations, updates to aging infrastructure as our system is approaching 45 years old. And uh, a good majority of the rest of the budget goes to wellhead protection to protect our groundwater. Um, so thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to Wayne Thompson, the vice president of our board. Mr. Thompson, please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning. My name is Wayne Thompson, vice president of the Rock County Rural Water Board. Thank you for your time this morning to listen. Um, my part of it is, is I am an egg producer. So I'm going to show the importance of water quality and availability in raising livestock. On my own personal farm, I raise on hand, I have 8,000 pigs on hand. And I use an average of about 200,000 gallons a month of water. The consistency and quality of water is very important to the health care of the animal to keep them on a steady diet. And it is important to supply that uh, well-needed food in the future. Uh, there is, people have talked about having wells instead. Well, that does not, you are not guaranteed the quality or quantity of water there. And with uh, real water, we are consistent at all times. Uh, another thing is delivery of water, constant pressure is important. And the other thing is for um, fire and everything else as far as protecting our buildings. A lot of these buildings now that we house these animals in, replacement costs are anywhere from 800,000 to a million to do that. So. Having water available for us is a very important. And I'll pass it on and thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, thank you. My name is Scott Lusbrook. I'm the director of Rock County Rural Water. Um, I would just like to thank you all for your time today. We are looking at a, uh, a bill for $2 million for the renovation or to build a brand new water tower. Um, the, without this water tower, our storage, like Ryan said, is short. Um, it up, actually impacts some of our customers. We have a lot of rural customers on the pressure side of things. So if we could get this world water tower through, uh, it would greatly impact our system um, and help keep the pressure going. Um, as a business owner in the community, uh, the, community um, the impact and growth uh, is huge. I'm an electrical contractor and we service a lot of farms, a lot of egg buildings, and we see a lot of uh, on my part, if that didn't have that impact of having the water uh, supply, a lot of farmers say, well, I can't do it. Um, so in the community itself uh, will be huge if we can get this through uh, the impact uh, for growth and safety in the community. Uh, good quality water from Lewis and Clark. We have that now. Blending it is a plus and with the amount of storage will be a greatly asset to Rock County Rural Water. Thank you for your time and have a great day. I see no questions. Thank you, Representative Schumacher, for coming by with your testifiers to present your bills. Next on the agenda is House File 4327. Representative Rasmussen, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Before I begin, I will note the A1 amendment that updates the appropriation in the bill to 750,000. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the hearing today on House File 4327 which would complete the Glendalough State Park Visitor Center. This has been a collaboration between the legislature, the DNR, and Glendalough Park Partners. Glendalough State Park has experienced major growth in visitation. In 2014, about 50,000 people visited the park annually. Last year, about 130,000 people visited the park. Given this increase in visitation, a visitor center is needed for this key state asset. I will turn it over to my testifier, Dan Malmstrom from Glendalow Park Partners to talk more about the request. Mr. Malmstrom, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chairman Lee. My name is Dan Malmstrom. I'm a member of the uh, Glendalow State Park Park Partners Advisory Board. Uh, we've existed for more than 30 years at the park's inception, and uh, we raise a lot of philanthropy that goes to augment uh, the DNR resources at this state park. I'm gonna share my screen and can uh, with brevity take you through the rationale of our request for $750,000. 
So um, what I'd like to do for the benefit of the committee is just to give you a brief background of Glendalough State Park. As uh, Representative Grant Rasmussen has said, this is a collaboration between the DNR, Glendalough Park Partners, as well as the Parks and Trails Council of Minnesota. Uh, Glendalough State Park is located in central Minnesota. There are six pristine lakes that are located within the boundary of the state park. This state park was donated to the state of Minnesota by the Coles and Ballantine uh, families, AKA the Star Tribune of Minnesota. Uh, this park has a rich heritage. Uh, this photo is actually artistically done, but it represents the dignitaries have frequented uh, Glendola over the last century. Dwight D. Eisenhower, President Nixon, Walter Mondale, Al Qui, and the list goes on and on. Uh, up in the upper right-hand corner, you see the historic lodge where these gentlemen and dignitaries stayed. That building, which is on the National Registry, is currently serving as the visitor center, which it was not intended to do. This park is managed with it's primitive appeal and it's a beautiful park and Glendalough Park Partners is looking to retain that. The project that Representative uh, Rasmussen uh, talked about had great ras rationale, which I won't go through in a lot of detail because this was presented to the House and the Senate and approved in 2018 bonding, $750,000. There is no visitor center at Glendalough State Park. Uh, there is a 12 mile bike and pedestrian trail that local citizens have actually spearheaded since 2010. There are now five segments that make up this trail. Another one, which is going in the park uh, this summer, uh, 130,000 visitors frequented the park. Eight school districts use the park uh, for academic uh, interpretation and education each year, again, without a visitor center. And as you can see in this slide, the visitor center was not, uh, or the historic lodge was not designed as a visitor, visitor center. The DNR, the Coles family, Ballotine family, and the local park partners made up of 550 paid members is intent on making sure that we preserve this beautiful building. The testimony at a glance, uh, this project was fully funded in 2018. Uh, before we asked for state bonding, bonding then, our park partners raised $220,000 of philanthropy, brought it to the House and Senate. It was approved $750,000 and we had legacy funds uh, along with additional philanthropy that was prepared to be raised by park partners. As you all know, COVID hit. Um, lots of things changed in the paradigm for uh, making construction happen. The DNR, uh, without face-to-face -face access to a lot of the assets in the park, had their design, geology, archaeology, septic, and bidding process all delayed. During that delay, as you know, lots of things experienced inflation. The project, which was estimated at about $1.3 million in 2018, has now um, increased to about 2 to $2.2 .2 million. Glendale Park Partners, a town of 800 people, were really good at fundraising, but we can't bridge that gap of $750,000, which is a conservative gap. And that is, in essence, the rationale for our, our request today. The project is ready. This is one of the things that uh, may be um, dissimilar to some of the things that you're hearing um, you know, today in testimony. This project is ready to go. This is ready for construction in 2022. Design done. Um, and nearly done and the bidding is ready to go out uh, this summer and fall and construction to start this fall. It continues to be fully supported by Representative Rasmussen, um, Senator Ingeberson, Minnesota DNR, Parks and Trails, by the way, I believe the DNR is actually listening in to this testimony and Glendalow Park Partners. We have 2,500 followers for the Glendalow Trail and Park Partners right now, 550 paid members, many of who have given to this project. We don't want to see this go by the wayside because of the inflation and the uh, construction costs. Uh, to show verifiability of the shovel readiness of this project, these are DNR, DNR pieces of collateral, not Glendalow Park Partners. Uh, these are the designs, elevations, the septic, land use plans, and the floor plan. This is a project that is ready to go. I thank you for your consideration. Uh, this is another example, again, where the state of Minnesota partners with local stewardship. We're all volunteers in the park. We give our money to the park and projects like this. Students, citizens are the beneficiaries for generations to come. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would entertain any questions that uh, the committee may have. Representative Erdahl. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, Mr. Malstrom, uh, over the years, uh, we've been made well aware of uh, Glendale Park uh, through the efforts of uh, former Representative Nornis. 
And uh, I was just wondering, I, I know that you do a fundraising walk each year. Uh, wh what is the date of that this year? Yeah, so the walk is being held on April 23rd this year. It coincides with uh, the Earth Day weekend. And yes, uh, we're actually able to do a face-to-face -face walk. We've done the virtual walk for the past two years. Un unbelievably so, our fundraising during the virtual walks had an outpouring of donations and philanthropy that actually exceeded our face-to-face -face walks in the prior years. So we have a very engaged um, partner base, let's put it that way. Representative Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Mr. Malstrom. Uh, well, I'd love to be there this year, but I, unfortunately I have a convention I've got to be, be at. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, maybe a Representative Rasmussen will be walking alongside Representative Nornis for you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I could, um, one of the people who showed up face-to-face -face at the park last year when it was a virtual walk, early in the morning during the walk, was Representative Rasmussen. He is an advocate, has been bef long before he became a representative at the state, and uh, we applaud his efforts along with uh, his family, who's always there at the walk each year. Thank you so much, Mr. Uh, Erdahl. Thank you, Mr. Malmstrom. And I understand that the DNR is on. And so uh, is it Mr. Burgeon? Can you let me know? Is this uh, part of any of the DNR requests? Would this be funded by any of the current DNR requests? And if not, why not? Sure. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, committee members. Uh, my name is Ben Berge, and I am a regional manager in Region 1 for DNR. So um, the DNR has really appreciates the work of the Glendale State Park Park Partners Group. As mentioned, this is a collaborative project. Uh, we have identified past legacy funds for this project uh, in prior years, and are will currently once a once the current bonding cycle is done, um, we will obviously have to triage all the the uh, projects we have. As much of our work is done to maintain our existing infrastructure. And so I, I can't say with certainty that none of that fund, that none of the future funds that could come out of the bonding session would go for this, but we obviously have many uh, facilities that we have to maintain, and that is a primary focus of our bonding request at this time. So Mrs. Zerbergi, can you just clarify, can this request be fulfilled by any of the current requests right now uh, through the programs from the DNR? Um, I can't answer that request, but I can get back to you. That is a agency decision and would come once the official bonding would be recognized in terms of how much that bonding is. Not, not knowing what that number is once the, once the session closes, I, I, it's hard for me to, I can't speculate on that. Right, what I'm trying to figure out is which program would this fall under the DNR? So this is in Parks and Trails. So this is in the Division of Parks and Trails. Okay, thank you for that. Yep, sorry about that. So see no other questions. Thank you, uh, Rep Representative Rasmussen, for coming by to present this bill. Next on the agenda is House File 4463, Representative Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Chair, I do have an amendment. Yep, please proceed with explaining it and just go with your uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the A1 amendment just defines more precisely the boundaries of the, pro the, the proposed project. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to present House Bill 4463, a bill to help the city of Excelsior reconstruct failing roadways and sidewalks. The ask is for $2.2 million to improve pedestrian access and accessibility for non-motorized travelers and vehicular traffic in and around downtown Excelsior. Excelsior is a small city, both in size and population. It sits on less than one square mile and has a population of about 2,400 people. It's the downtown center of the South Lake Minnetonka community and a regional commercial hub on the south shores of the lake. But it does not receive LGA or municipal state aid and is a net contributor, contributor to the fiscal disparities program. Excelsior is a small tax base with 45% of the property within the city limits being property tax exempt. The median income is below the median income of the Minneapolis-St. Paul Metro. 7% of its residents live below the poverty line, and 61% of the housing is rental, with 56 of those units classified as affordable. In spite of those limitations, Excelsior has invested over $22 million into its infrastructure over the past 11 years. For these reasons, the city is requesting state help to ensure safe and accessible access for pedestrians and non-motorized travelers and vehicular traffic in its downtown. 
And Mr. Chair, I do have testifiers from the city of Excelsior this morning. I believe Excelsior Council Member Jennifer Karen is here. Council Member Karen, welcome back. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chair Lee. Hello again. My name is Jennifer Caron. I'm an Excelsior City Council member, and I'm here on behalf of Mayor Todd Carlson and the rest of the Excelsior City Council. I'm accompanied by City Manager Christy Luger and City Engineer Morgan Dolly from WSB. I'd first like to thank Representative Morrison for her ongoing support of our request um, for infrastructure assistance. So on Tuesday, you heard um, a lot of statistics we gave you regarding Excelsior, but I want to emphasize a few additional points today. First, our size. As Representative Morrison said, we are less than one square mile. What that translates to is 557 acres in size. If you deduct the 45% of the property that is tax exempt, that leaves us 307 acres of taxable property. It's quite small. Um, we are, as Representative Morrison said, the regional hub for the South Lake Minnetonka community. We are the only downtown. We are also a visitor destination for the Twin Cities and greater Minnesota. We are known for our events and we draw over 100,000 people annually to our downtown and our Commons Park and that number continues to grow. Our business district relies on those visitors to spend in Excelsior. Our business district also is quite small. It's um, you know one street uh, that dead ends into the lake and then a second street that um, is adjacent to uh, one block up from the lake. We have an operating budget of 2.6 million for 2022. Of that, we levied 2.2 million. The difference is made up in fees and uh, parking meter revenue. We are one of only two cities that we know of who charge for parking outside of Minneapolis and St. Paul. And we obviously do that at trying to capture some of that visitor revenue. Um, it's a tough balancing act. We obviously don't want to deter people from coming to Excelsior, but it is a revenue source. So for a city that is this small to have issued 22 million in bonds over the past 12 years is pretty remarkable. We recognized that we had a responsibility to address a long deferred maintenance issue. So we developed our street and utility replacement plan some 15 years ago. We did not ask the state for help then, but we feel we have no alternative now. Our infrastructure needs are still great and we are exhausting our means to address them as our debt levy grows. When we began replacement, we had to prioritize those streets where residents were experiencing brown water. We had people filling bathtubs with rusty brown water, taking showers outside of Excelsior to avoid that and washing clothes at friends' homes to avoid rusty streaks on their lighter colored items. The city flushed hydrants almost on a weekly schedule to attempt to help the situation. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, oh, wrong one. All right, I can't get the right one, but this is good enough. If you look at the pavement condition index uh, in the materials that we submitted you, so you do have it in your materials, you can see in blue and green, and it works as well on this map, um, all of the streets we've addressed so far. This map is the water main pipe year map. So it shows you down here how old our uh, remaining mains are. Much of, um, so the blue and green is all the streets we've addressed so far, both main and reconstruction of street. Much of what is in the oldest part of Excelsior is where we had brown water. So this is the streets we're talking about today, Third Street and Center. Um, the road condition mir mirrors the water main, uh, age of water main issue. We still have a very long stretch of Third Street and Center Street, which is adjacent to the business district. So it's heavily trafficked to replace. These are now the oldest mains and streets in Excelsior. The good news is that because Excelsior issued that 22 million in bonds, we will be able to continue ongoing maintenance and replacement when the bonds mature starting in 2040 by reissuing them. The bad news is that we have 13 million in unaddressed street and water main projects yet to go. Your support of our request for the total project of 4.6 million will go a long way towards closing this gap. We were asked on Tuesday if we had applied for a PFA loan. 
Yes, we did for an earlier project, and we will continue to look at that program in the future. However, adding more debt is not desirable. And if we have to wait until PFA funds are available, if we are in, then behind other cities, well, we, we simply cannot wait. We have 100 year old pipes and broken pavement that we must address. We cannot continue to um, uh, repair water main breaks when we have six in 10 months. It's just not sustainable. So we are respectfully asking the committee to support our request for funding our most urgent need for our oldest streets and water mains. Our request today, um, HF 4463, is for the street reconstruction portion of the project at 2.2 million. The water portion that we discussed on Tuesday was 2.4. The total need is 4.6 million. Thank you for your consideration of our request. Thank you, Council Member, and thank you, uh, Representative Morrison, for coming by to present this bill. Next on the agenda is House File 4550. Representative Feist, please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, uh, thank you so much for hearing this bill on behalf of Seika Food Shelf. Seika Food Shelf and Thrift Store in Columbia Heights provides basic needs and services to communities of Anoka County and Northeast Minneapolis. Seika's mission is to serve participants with dignity and respect and to provide a positive pathway to stability and self-sufficiency. Seika requests 1.5 million in state funds to pre-design design, construct, engineer, furnish, and equip a new building that will help SACA continue its work to end hunger in Anoka County and Northeast Minneapolis. Since March 2020, demand for food shelf services has skyrocketed, making the need for a new facility urgent. In 2021, SACA provided 800,006 pounds of food to 49,115 individuals. At present, they see at least two to five new participants daily. To meet this increased demand, SACA is building a new facility that will be a one-stop shop for basic needs, hunger relief, and beyond. SACA has already secured 543,380 in project support from individual donors, civic organizations, and in-kind support project management. They have engaged over 1,000 people and had extensive meetings with the community and stakeholders to plan this relocation meticulously. Upon receiving the requested funding, SACA is ready to jump into action, expanding its staff and its ability to serve the community. Housing instability, job losses, and other health and financial hardships related to the pandemic will continue to fuel food insecurity for years to come. SACA, a Columbia Heights institution that is run with unique efficiency through strong leadership and extensive volunteer commitment will be there to ensure that those in need are fully supported. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Dave Rudolph, our testifier. Mr. Rudolph, please identify yourself and proceed. Yeah, I'm Dave Rudolph, co-director of uh, SACA Food Shelf. Uh, thank you, Chair Lee, Representative Feist and the members of the committee. Uh, SACA is part of a larger family of food shelves and hunger relief programs across the state who need funding to support the following initiatives. Uh, no cost meal programs for students who need them, access to SNAP, funding for food support and capital grants for food shelves, home delivered meals for veterans, expanded farm to school grants. Today, I'm asking you to support SACA's $1.5 million request to the Minnesota legislature to construct an urgently needed new building. Our current facility is inadequate forcing us to store much of our food off-site and restricting our ability to provide services. Our new building will enable us to serve 10,000 more people each year, expand our services, and add significant social and economic benefits to our community. SACA has been actively fundraising from sources that include conventional loans, individual and corporate donors, and public funding. We're working with the City of Columbia Heights to acquire a parcel of city-owned land. We have undertaken extensive planning, community consultation, and are ready to start work as soon as we have the required funds. SACA is the last line of defense for families who are struggling to maintain an active and productive role in society. SACA services include providing fresh produce, proteins, hygiene products, and household goods to families, individuals, and school children, and professional clothing to individuals seeking employment. 70% of SACA's clients have a source of income, but it is not enough to cover their basic expenses. Without SACA's help, these families would we would be forced to rely on social services, which are not as cost effective as SACA services. Every dollar allows SACA to purchase 10 plus pounds of food, which allows SACA to feed a family of four on $40 per month. 
This is in part due to SACA's minimal overhead expenses. SACA leverages volunteer efforts for 93% of its activities and significantly outperforms similar organizations in our area for impact per dollar spent. To us, it's important to support SACA for two reasons. One, we empower families to meet their basic needs and achieve financial stability without relying on social services. And supporting SACA will enable us to serve a greater number of families, giving them a more dignified experience and expand and diversify our services. I'm gonna close with a short note from Polly. She is a Spring Lake Park resident. Uh, she's on our SACA Delivers program that's for homebound seniors and disabled people. Uh, she said, this food, this food delivery stuff is a godsend. It's wonderful that we can choose and I love the food that we get. I was getting so little before. I ate a lot of peanut butter sandwiches. I worked hard my whole life, even had an IRA, lost it all to medical bills. Thank you for your time today, and we hope that you will include SACA in the House bonding bill. Thank you, Mr. Rudolph. Uh, thank you, Representative Fires, for coming by to present your bill. Next on the agenda is House File 4703, Representative Hurd. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for uh, hearing House File 4703 today. I just want to make sure, uh, um, Chair Lee, if that was the bill that you referenced. My apologies. I'm it is. Yeah. Please thank proceed. You. Thank you. Uh, Chair Lee and committee, thank you for uh, hearing uh, House File 4703 today. We are actually here to present the request for public functionary, which is a 501c3 nonprofit. I know that we don't have a lot of time today, so I want to make sure that I leave the bulk of the time for my testifiers, but I just wanted to point out that a public Functionary is an organization that serves the arts community and it provides studio space, uh, exhibit, uh, exhibition and community garden, uh, gathering spaces, production support for artists and creative services, mural commissions, uh, art consulting and content production. And uh, the organization does a lot of with what they have and that they are coming to the state to ask for uh, $2 million. And so with that, Mr. Chair, I would like to turn uh, my, over my time to the two testifiers that are here today. Ms. Hearing, uh, please identify yourself and proceed. Uh, my name is Trisha Hearing, and I am the artistic director and co-founder of Public Functionary. Thank you, Chair Lee, and the committee for hearing our case today. I'm testifying to request $2 million to expand on a decade of work and build a community art center in Northeast Minneapolis. We represent an underserved demographic, young emerging artists who are socially, geographically, and racially diverse. It's our next generation of creative workers in the state. We have led and managed arts facilities as a team for over 15 years, and our vision is based on our firsthand perspective as artists and cultural producers, and our work is built on the limitations that we experienced ourselves within existing arts institutions. We have facilities in development to build a next generation legacy arts organization, a multi-use complex of creative production accessible to a broad public. We are supported through a partnership with ArtSpace, a locally based arts developer, to ensure the success of the project. Public Functionary received a $1 million grant from Intermedia Arts, a 44-year-old legacy organization, a nonprofit that ended their operations in the last few years and closed their beloved center. With these funds, they co-signed our ability to be a core center for the arts sector for the next 40 years, providing us with a solid base to scale up our organization. Although the funds created a pathway to sustainability without additional investment, our capital goals will not be possible. Community art centers are the core to the sustainability of creative workers, providing professional, social, and recreational experiences that develop opportunity networks. Artists are at the forefront of our new work paradigm. The post-COVID economy will depend on flexible, creative entrepreneurs. And there should be a community art center in every city, town, neighborhood, because these centers provide essential needs the same way that libraries, youth centers, and spiritual spaces support resilient communities. It's very rare to see funding of this scale go directly to those of us in the art sector who truly represent diverse cultural artistic communities. Those of us who have been committed to change work, driven by passion and belief that arts and culture make our state a healthy and thriving place for all. Thank you so much. Ms. Barlow, are you uh, planning to testify too? If so, please identify yourself, proceed. Yes, thank you. Hello, my name is Leslie Barlow and I'm the director of the Public Functionary Studios, or as we say, PF Studios. 
I wear many hats that intersect. So in addition to my role at public functionary, I'm also an educator. I've taught at the University of Minnesota and Carleton College, and I'm a visual artist. My advocacy for underrepresented artists is inherent to my belief in civic responsibility and born from my own experiences of marginalization as a younger black female artist. When I moved into an art studio in the Northrop King building, the disparities in the building quickly became clear and I felt rather alone. The reality is young artists ages 18 to 30, artists of color and lower income artists experience unique challenges, rarely can afford studio space and don't feel welcome in these kinds of buildings. To address these issues for myself and for many artists in my community, I teamed up with Public Functionary and in 2019, we started the PF Studios program, subsidized communal studio spaces, mentorship and workshops. We have since grown from a program of nine artists to over 30 artists with a waiting list and a need for more space. Our goal is to build a stronger arts ecosystem where we all thrive, one where young artists don't need to leave to other cities or states to find community and make a living. In the last three years, PF Studios artists have secured exhibition opportunities, fellowships, residencies, grants, and sales. Many of these have been firsts for them and led to sustainable career paths that they didn't know were possible. Each achievement for a PF Studios artist has a ripple effect with their families and networks and communities. My parents have been teachers in the Twin Cities public schools for a combined 62 years, and they've made it clear to me that an investment in our young people is an investment in our future. Please join me in our ever-growing network of artists in supporting the economic and social impact of our platform and in recognizing the essential nature of artists' work in creating a vibrant and innovative society. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barlow. Representative Lucero. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just have a quick question for the bill author. As I uh, consider all of these bills for competing funds and I survey the, the purpose of government and our constitution, clearly the constitution and government exists to ensure public safety, law enforcement, judicial system, to ensure for the Minnesota constitution an education system, to ensure a roads and bridges transportation system and other very limited functions. How do I convey a conversation to my constituents that I'm and others are seeking to tax them, tax their money to redistribute for purposes of art. How is that the purpose of government? Represent her. Hi, Chair Lee, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and for the question, Representative Lucero, um, I, I think that when we as a state and as a country say that we uh, fight for uh, equity and justice and that we care about thriving and vibrant communities, that that includes art. And I think that we have demonstrated over and over and over again that art actually has been invested with public dollars for as long as I can remember. And I'm sure for as long as those who have been in the legislature can remember. And so I think that as we as a country grapple with the issues that are in front of us, whether it is social issues, whether it is um, issues around class, around uh, the different divisions that exist, the disparities that exist around us, that it is actually in our best interest, best public interest to invest in art and to invest in the ways that art actually enriches our culture, not just as a um, way of people uh, looking at it as an entertainment, but it is actually a way for communities to heal from the trauma that our country, which has, uh, you know, has hurt communities of color, uh, communities from uh, uh, low-income communities, those who have been marginalized and included, those from uh, communities that are disabled, and we, uh, it is a way for them to heal from their own trauma, but to share their experiences so that we can grow as a state to be a better state that it is inclusive. And so I, I think that we can decide as a group how we choose to talk about this and why we choose to invest in it, because if we want to look at close to disparities as it comes in, as it exists in housing and education and healthcare, that there's actually art that addresses many, many of these issues and allows us to move forward. And so I don't know how you would like to talk about it, but that's the way I talk about it. And that is why I think we should absolutely invest in arts organization doing this type of work. Representative Lilly. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Representative Her. Uh, thank you very much for bringing us forward today. Uh, um, just uh, regards to that last comment, I, I just want to say that we've really heard in the legacy committee, we've heard strong testimony on, you know, uh, Representative Herr speaks of the 
uh, cultural values. There's also a huge economic driver for the state of Minnesota. There's tons of jobs and uh, opportunities that are related to these uh, investments in our, our community. And let's be honest, the quality of life. I mean, look outside today. It's, it's not our weather that draws uh, these uh, people to Minnesota necessarily, uh, but uh, certainly our robust arts community and uh, and really art draw us all together as Representative Her is talking about. But there's huge economic driver for Minnesota with uh, our arts community, just simply in that. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Representative Lilly. And just wanted to add on, you know, the legacy amendment, that is, that is where Minnesotans have, you know, gone on and vote for the legacy amendment. That's where we have the arts and cultural heritage fund too. And so thank you for coming by, Representative Her. Next on the agenda. Sure, says, can I just ask? Quick question on that. Representative Sarah, we have to move on. Next on the agenda, House File 4216, Represent Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Um, so today I'm presenting House File 4216, which is a request for $2 million in cash funding for pre-design and design activities for RS Eden's transformational recovery campus uh, that will be developed in downtown Minneapolis. RS Eden is about to celebrate its 50th anniversary. It has 17 locations in the metro, but serves individuals and families from all over Minnesota. Initially, it was founded to provide low barrier, safe and stable housing and programming for individuals returning from incarceration. And RS Eden has now grown to providing comprehensive continuum of care services to support individuals and families who are facing issues of substance abuse, mental health and reentry. The Recovery Campus Project, which is located across the street from the Hennepin County Medical Center, will provide the continuum of care in one place and address gaps in existing statewide systems. Uh, the first two floors will be used to provide an integrated monitoring withdrawal services where individuals can go after exiting detox um, to then eventual residential treatment that will have supportive and permanent affordable housing. Um, so here to talk more about the project today is Caroline Hood, RS Eden's Executive Director. Thank you. Ms. Hood, please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Lee, members of the committee, and Representative Agbaje. My name is Caroline Hood, and I am President and CEO of RS Eden. And I'm pleased to testify in support of House File 4216. As Representative stated, we were founded in 1971 and have served the most vulnerable in our community for 50 years. Our expertise exists in three primary service areas. Through substance use disorder treatment, that's both residential and outpatient treatment, community reentry services for individuals exiting incarceration, and lastly, by both developing and providing permanent, supportive, and affordable housing services for both individuals and families. Embedded within all three of those service areas are mental health services, as complex clients' needs of mental health and experiences of trauma have significantly Im impacted their overall well-being. Our program spans 17 locations across the metro, but we serve folks from across the state. We serve primarily people of color as they are disproportionately overrepresented in the criminal justice and substance use disorder treatment systems. We serve approximately 1,000 people a day and about twice that over the course of a year. We are seeking $2 million in cash appropriation in the possible 2022 bonding bill to support the pre-design and design of what will be our comprehensive recovery campus. The campus will offer an integrated continuum of care, providing substance use treatment, medical services, mental health services, and affordable housing, all within a human-centered and trauma-informed space. The integration of services reduces barriers to access, decreasing the likelihood of overdose, death, and homelessness. In December 2021, RS Eden purchased three underutilized surface parking lots near downtown Minneapolis on the same city block where RS Eden already has our existing, existing treatment facility. We have full site control. We are blocks away from HCMC, both physically close and mission close. The proximity will serve both RS Eden clients as well as HCMC patients. There's really two outstanding components of the recovery campus that I wanna highlight. The first, as Representative Agbaje said, is the integration of what is a clinical withdrawal management services within residential treatment. It would be the first of its kind in the state of Minnesota. What it does is it addresses an unmet gap in continuum of care between detox and treatment, a gap that currently has patients being discharged to the streets 
to continue problematic and dangerous substance use. The second piece is that the permanent supportive and affordable housing will comply with the city's height requirements of the 2040 plan, adding a significant number of affordable units to reduce the overwhelming need. Instead of sharing a success story, I thought I'd share some live data. So we track and on average, our Eden must turn away approximately 60% of our substance use treatment clients who are referred to us in order to stay compliant with our DHS regulations for residential treatment. Because the client's needs are too complex after discharge from detox, because they're still considered too medically unstable to qualify for residential treatment, they can't be admitted. So currently there is no treatment facility in the state of Minnesota for individuals to go to for this clin clinical withdrawal management. Last week, 60% of the clients, what that meant in reality was 10 actual human beings. So last week we had 10 people who entered, came to our doors, we assessed them, we met them, they wanted to stay, and we had to say, we can't help you. This gap in the system is preventing the help. So RS Eden is seeking to achieve our mission by building a campus that meets all regulations, embeds humanity within the buildings, and decreases the negative impacts of the intersecting problems of opioid use and homelessness. Thank you so much for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Hood, and thank you, Representative Agbaje, for bringing your bill forward. Uh, next on the agenda is House File 4244, Chair Moran. Good morning, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> So House File 4244 Irreducible Grace Foundation has worked with youth of color and their allies for over 10 years. This group provides trauma healing techniques and workshops to communities all across the state through youth led workshops. Their youth team members have experienced unemployment, homelessness, mental health concerns, and other barriers that affect their daily lives. The project that they are proposing will provide the holistic structure for employment, for housing, for mental health support and mentorship. These are the ingredients needed for young black individuals to be successful in our state. The site will provide over 75 jobs annually, 60 being youth positions. Mr. Chair, I believe I have uh, maybe two testifiers. First with Dr. Fry. Dr. Fry, welcome. Please identify yourself and proceed. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Lee and the committee for hearing House File 4244. I would also like to thank Representative Moran for supporting this project. In every state level, positive quality of life metric, employment, housing, home ownership, education, and wealth, Blacks are experiencing the greatest racial disparity. Yet in every negative met metric, homelessness, substance use, violence, mental health concerns, food instability, the same population is at the top of the chart. As you all may know from research from the Minnesota Department of Health, poverty rates for adolescents are three to five times higher for African-Americans in our state. African-American students are much more likely than white students to report frequent emotional distress, including sadness, nervousness, high stress, and hopelessness. These groups report also a higher rate of suicidal thoughts. African-American students report the highest rate of chronic physical health problems in, and in general asthma in particular. To combat these conflicting data reports in the lives of black youth and their families in the state of Minnesota, we need a holistic long-term culturally derived opportunity created in the community and by the community. Irreducible Grace Foundation would like to establish a cultural healing site for Black youth. We are in the process of buying a school building in St. Paul to convert into an employment, housing, mental health, wellness, and healing arts space. We need the capital investment funds to convert this site to host 60 Black youth employment positions. There will also be 16 residential youth leaders who live at the center and run the programming for the community. Hundreds of participants will utilize this site. Overcoming many of the barriers these young people face is a matter of community health, it's a matter of public safety, and it's a matter of managing the long-term state program resources. This site will sustain long-term through the services it will develop via contracts, social enterprises, and service fees. 
Irreducible Grace is requesting a $1 million for the purchase, redesign, design, and renovation of this building in St. Paul to offer Black youth a space to engage in holistic support through their cultural heritage. Irreducible Grace Foundation has raised $600,000 in private donations since December of 2021. The total cost of this project is $6.6 million. Additional funding is being sought from the city, the county, and private funders. Thank you for your time in changing the negative trajectory for Black youth in the state of Minnesota. I would be happy to entertain any questions. We do not have an additional testifier today. Thank you, Dr. Fry, and thank you, Chair Moran, for this bill presentation. Next on the agenda is Rep, uh, Chair Moran, House File 4601. Please proceed. Okay, members, House File 4601 is a bill for the YWCA in St. Paul who has served the city of St. Paul and Ramsey County since 1907. With a mission of eliminating racism and empowering women, the YWCA program empowered low-income women and families from communities of color through direct services in support of housing, youth development, and employment, all areas of deep racial disparities in Minnesota. They are asking for the state of Minnesota to fund $8.2 million of the 35 million project costs of the YWCA new facility. Um, I have a great testifier here, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, so I'm gonna stop and allow her to proceed. Thank you. Ms. Adams Massey, please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you, Chairman Lee. Thank you, Representative Moran and members of the committee. And good afternoon. My name is Gay Adams Massey and I'm CEO of YWCA St. Paul. Thank you for hearing testimony on House Bill 4601. Really appreciate the opportunity to share this project with you. Our organization has served the city of St. Paul and Ramsey County since 1907. And for the past three decades, we've operated at our current location on Selby Avenue, which is right at the old meeting, at the meeting place of the old Rondo neighborhood and the Cathedral Hill neighborhood, primary, organization, primary neighborhoods we serve. We're a Black-led organization serving women and their families as part of our mission to eliminate racism and empower women. We deliver human services programs that empower low-income women and their families from communities of color who are primarily African-American through direct services in supportive housing, youth development, and employment. And as you know, these are all areas of deep disparity in Minnesota. In our supportive housing program, we have five sites of housing, providing permanent supportive housing and transitional housing. We have a, several workforce programs that really help people get on track for jobs and contribute to Minnesota's economy. And we work with older youth, helping them move forward in their education and careers. We also promote equity in our community through ad, advocacy and racial justice education across the Twin Cities. We also operate a health and fitness center at our site. It's our social enterprise and it financially supports our programs while supporting health and wellness in the broader community. So to allow us to help more women and families realize their dreams and to meet escalating needs, um, our goal is to uh, redevelop, to build a new facility on our current site. Um, through this investment, we really envision our aging facility being transformed into a healing community asset, as well as a revenue generating social enterprise. With a new building on our site, specifically designed to support expanded programming and our fitness center operations, um, third party analysis projects substantially increased revenue which can be reinvested in our programs, operations, and capacity, allowing us to serve more people in need of our support. The, re the redevelopment project also creates the opportunity for us to partner with Project for Pride in Living, a nonprofit affordable housing developer with whom you may be familiar, to build affordable housing on the site, something our community sorely needs. We also hope to partner with the Neighborhood Development Center to create asset building opportunities by adding minority-owned businesses to the site. We're on the corner of Selby and 
Western Avenue, which is a prime retail location. We're asking the state, state to help fund a portion of the cost of this project, the remainder of which would be funded through the capital campaign, sale of land, financing, and other sources. The redevelopment, this redevelopment project will allow us to expand the numbers served in our programs, which address these key areas of disparity and bring significant benefit to low-income women and families in communities of color who are seeking to escape homelessness and overcome barriers in education and employment. Families in the community will be able to access new affordable housing units. We're hopeful to have some supportive units as well. And aspiring minority small business owners will have access to a prime retail location to begin a process of wealth creation that will impact generations. We will be able to generate greater income through our social enterprise to direct toward our programs and operations. And as you likely know, earned income is particularly important to nonprofit organizations. It lets us invest in our staff and our equipment as well as our direct service work and helps us continue to deliver critically needed services when there are changes in the philanthropic priorities of our traditional funders. The redevelopment will significantly contribute to the vibrancy of the Rondo and Cathedral Hill communities and allow us to bring more resources and services to St. Paul and Ramsey County. We ask for your support by approving the opposed, a proposed appropriation and we um, appreciate your consideration. I'm happy to um, take any questions the committee might have. Thank you, uh, Ms. Adams Massey. Chair Moran, I understand there's the A1 amendment. Can you explain the A1 amendment? Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, give me one second. I have this here. So let's see. So what the A1 amendment does is the appropriation amount is changed from 1 million to the 8.2 million. The project phases of construct and furnish are added to the pre-design and design, which are in the bill as it was introduced. Uh, it describes the project as a new building rather than a renovation because this bill has been heard in previous times. And a technical change is added clarifying that the appropriation is a one-time appropriation and the effective date, uh, uh, the effective date of day following final enactment is added. Thank you, Chair Moran. Uh, seeing no question, we'll move on to the last bill on the agenda, which is my bill, House File 4188, uh, which is an appropriations uh, for avenues for youth uh, to appropriate 6 million to acquire property, design and build a new trauma center building Avenues for Youth serves uh, youth ages 16 to 24 in Hennepin County. And with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ms. Mears. Please identify yourself and proceed. Thank you. My name is Katherine Mears, and I am the Executive Director of Avenues for Youth. We support youth experiencing homelessness with shelters in both Minneapolis and Brooklyn Park. Members of the committee, Chair Lee, thank you so much for the opportunity to testify of House File 4188, and thank you so much, Chairman, for authoring and introducing this effort. Minnesota is facing an unsheltered homelessness crisis. Avenues works every day to address that crisis, but shelter capacity in the metro and statewide is not even close enough to meet the need. Avenues provides emergency shelter, short-term housing, and support for youth experiencing homelessness in a safe and nurturing environment. Every year, we support more than 300 young people. However, youth homelessness continues to grow. In Minnesota, an estimated 13,300 youth will experience homelessness this year. 73% of them are Black, Indigenous, and youth of color, and 30% of youth experiencing homelessness report they stayed in an abusive situation because they had no other housing options. Youth experiencing homelessness have distinct needs that are different from those of single adults or families. When provided developmentally appropriate supports, youth can successfully move into stable housing and thrive as young adults. Shantasia, who has allowed me to share her story, is a perfect example. Shantasia came to Avenues after living in an abandoned house and couch. She felt depressed, angry, and suicidal. 
and avenues she was able to stabilize and overcome uh, and deal with her trauma. And over time, she opened up to staff about her dream to become a nurse. She took full advantage of the education and employment resources avenues offered. And while living at avenues, she became a certified nursing assistant. She has since moved into her own apartment and is pursuing a career as a registered nurse. Youth like Shantasia need a home to call their own and shelters can provide that home as they prepare for more permanent options. Avenues plans to build a new home for our shelter and transitional housing program in Minneapolis that is trauma informed and meets the specific needs of youth. Our current Minneapolis building was built in 1934 and it served many purposes over the years before being converted to a shelter. The space does not adequately meet the needs of youth recovering from trauma. Crowded conditions forced us to reduce capacity during the COVID-19 pandemic, a reduction that we can ill afford when the need is so great. A new building will allow us to grow our programming to help fill the gap between the needs of youth experiencing homelessness and current shelter. However, financing shelter capital projects is difficult. From the federal government down to city governments, there are minimal funding options for shelter capital. It requires us to braid multiple funding streams of small amounts over the course of a multi-year capacity campaign. This is Minnesota's opportunity to make an unprecedented and historic investment in this critical infrastructure that saves lives. The longer we wait, the more youth like Shantasia will continue to couch hop, live on the streets, and stay in abusive situations. Avenues is seeking $6 million cash appropriation through the bonding bill to help us build this new facility so that we can provide a safer and more accessible shelter for our youth experiencing homelessness. The total, total cost of the project is estimated to be $12 million. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak to this crucial investment for our organization and our community. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. See no questions. Members, that concludes our agenda for today. I really appreciate all of our bill authors for coming by and for the testifiers for spending the time with us today to explain their proposal. Uh, members, our next meeting is Tuesday, April 5th, and seeing no uh, other questions, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.